Hello everyone, we're back again with another critique video. Today on the channel we have Yoga Body, 764,000 subscribers. This video is entitled The Seed Oil Myth, 21 years on seed oils and not dead yet, which of course definitely means that seed oils are not harmful at all, you know, because someone's been doing it for 21 years and eating them for 21 years and hasn't died. You know, we've heard of smokers that have lived well into their hundreds. So therefore, smoking is not conducive to leading to early death. Anyway, let's just jump directly into this, but first, if you haven't subscribed to the Patreon listed in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, please go ahead and subscribe to that to gain access to one week early uploads, one extra video per week, ad-free content, and uncensored content. And if you haven't bought my book yet, Contraindicated, that will be linked in the description below as well. So, with that being said, let's jump right into the video. If you're interested in health and wellness and you spend any amount of time online, you've no doubt heard that seed oils will kill you. They're most likely conducive to leading to early death, or at the very least, producing and allowing for the development of, and causing the development of the major killers in the United States, because they cause inflammation. And we'll get into why later on. Apparently, seed oils are so inflammatory that your C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, and other biomarkers for inflammation are just off the charts. You're walking around- It may very well be, yes. Like an inflamed ball of fire waiting to get cancer. Apparently, Heart disease is not caused by endothelial damage from smoking, high blood pressure, or chronically elevated LDLC. It's Those former two, they do lead to atherosclerosis as well, sir. The last one has nothing to do with heart disease whatsoever. And if you'd like more information on that, I would suggest watching my video that I did on Mayo Clinic at the beginning of this year in February. I'll link that in the top right corner of the screen. You guessed it. Seed oils and the obesity epidemic. You no, know, seed oils do also contribute, most likely. You see, the thing about seed oils is they are teeming with omega-6 fatty acids, primarily in the form of linoleic acid. Linoleic acid goes through a conversion process, going to form arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is a substrate that interacts with the enzymes cyclooxygenase and lipoxygenase. There's different forms of cyclooxygenase and probably for lipoxygenase as well. Doesn't matter. They react with those enzymes to produce four compounds. Thromboxanes, which are vasoconstrictors restrictors and blood clotters, prostaglandins and leukotrienes, which are mediators of acute inflammation, particularly the acute inflammatory cascade, but it's obviously an exacerbator of chronic inflammation, of course, especially if you continue eating them, it'll lead to chronic inflammation. And also lipoxins, which seem to actually do the opposite, but three out of the four compounds are inflammatory. So that's the first mechanism. Okay, the second mechanism is that the oxidation products within seed oils are aldehydes primarily. HNE is one, there's plenty of others. And the thing about aldehydes is that even in vastly small concentrations, they destroy lipid rafts by forming covalent bonds with those lipid rafts, which are very strong bonds, and deranging the proteins and causing them to leak or burst upon impact. They make them unstable and they rupture. So they destroy lipid rafts, they tear cell membranes to pieces, they actively bind to DNA and cause mutations to it. And just a fun little fact, the common denominator of all cancers, whether it be the cause or just a symptom, is DNA distortion or DNA damage. So interesting. And in a high enough concentration, but still relatively low, kill cells outright. What does that do? Well, that effectuates inflammation because inflammation is a pre-programmed response within the body when it has perceived damage to tissues or a potential invading pathogen. Aldehydes initiate that process for both of those reasons, by deranging proteins and making them being perceived by the body as foreign proteins, so pathogenic, potentially pathogenic, and also inducing tissue damage for the reasons that I just laid out. Inflammation is the underpinning cause of every major killer in not only the Western world, it's actually becoming the entire world. So there's that. Seed oils are just toxic. They're absolutely rancid. We can blame canola oil for that one too. All well, there's plenty of ones that are worse than that one, like grapeseed oil that has an omega-6 to omega-3 ratio of about 700 to 1, 600 to 800 to 1. Is nutribabble nonsense. This seed oil conspiracy is the weirdest thing ever. Oh, it's weird, sir? No, it's not. Okay, just saying something is weird does not make it the case. It is rooted in science. End of discussion. Whether you like that or whether I like that or not, it's the truth. Now, this is a highly refined food. Kind of like if you went to the supermarket and instead of buying bread, you bought croutons. Probably not the best choice, but you all- They're effectively the same f***ing thing. Don't need to make endless videos or fearmonger about the croutons on your salad. Seed oil- Well, you shouldn't be eating those because they all break down into glucose. And glucose is what? Oh, an aldehyde. It's an aldohexose. It's a six carbon aldehyde. Aldehydes and aldehyde functional groups themselves have the tendency to bind onto lipid rafts and destroy them. There is no safe concentration for aldehyde consumption in human beings. Kind of like that. I don't recommend you eat it, but at the same time, 
polyunsaturated fats in their natural whole food form, these are one of the best foods you could eat of all. According to what? According to you, your opinion? False. By the way, the amount of polyunsaturated fatty acids that are required for human beings is vastly low. It is incredibly low. And you get all of it from ruminant animal meat exclusively, which is what everyone should be eating, really. We're done. We evolved to eat animal fat, which is very, very, very low in polyunsaturated fatty acids, as long as you're eating the ones that are indicated for human consumption, that being ruminant animals, so. My name is Lucas. I'm a yoga teacher. I'm a nutritional coach. I have- It is sad that you're a nutritional coach. What makes you think that you are remotely competent to speak upon nutrition? I mean, th this video evinces your absolute ineptitude to understand nutrition in the first place and to actually give salubrious indicated advice. Polyunsaturated fatty acids almost exclusively for around 21 years. And so what? That doesn't matter. And also that's not seed oils. <laughs> the polyunsaturated fatty acids in the whole foods there they're not food for human beings because they're plants, are not the same as seed oils. Sorry, they're usually present in a healthy ratio and are not oxidized to hell. We call them polyunsaturated fatty acids. This seed oil term is really confusing. It's a recent invention of pop health. Lucas, seed oils are not the f***ing same as the oils that are naturally found within plants like cotton seeds. Shall I play the clip on the screen of how seed oils are made in the first place? When the canola seed arrives at the processing factory, it contains foreign material, mostly plant pieces. So the first step is to clean the seed in a vibrating sieve. The seeds, smaller than the openings in the sieve's mesh, fall through to a conveyor below. The foreign material remains on top. A conveyor moves it to a storage bin where it's collected for sale as cattle feed. The seeds pass by a magnet. It removes any metal that may have fallen in during the journey from field to factory. Next, the seeds enter a roller mill. They pass between two steel rollers, which crush them into thin flakes. A conveyor then feeds the flakes into a screw press. It has a large revolving screw-shaped shaft enclosed within a slotted cage. As the shaft turns, its threads squeeze the flakes with high pressure, forcing out the oil, which then drains out through the slots. 42% of canola seed is oil. The screw press extracts nearly three quarters of that. The remainder is still trapped in the pressed flakes, now referred to as canola cake. The cake exits the other end of the press and moves on to a second extraction. This one, a 70 minute wash with a solvent. This chemical extraction process removes all but a trace of oil. The factory then grinds the cake into protein rich meal, which it sells as animal feed. The extracted oil, stored in large tanks, now enters the refining phase. First, they wash the oil for 20 minutes with sodium hydroxide. During this wash cycle, they spin the oil at high speed so that the centrifugal force separates the natural impurities, which the factory later sells to soap manufacturers. After this cleaning process, the canola oil is visibly clearer. However, it still contains natural waxes, which make it look cloudy. So the next step is to cool the oil to 5 degrees Celsius. This thickens those waxes so they can be filtered out. The waxes don't go to waste either. The factory uses them to produce vegetable shortening. In the factory's lab, technicians recreate production on a small scale to ensure performance and quality. Meanwhile, back in the factory, after washing and filtering the oil, they bleach it to lighten the color. Then use a steam injection heating process to remove the canola odor. The oil is now fully refined and ready for bottling. What the hell? Those are not the same. This man actually just said that they're the same and that the seed oil is a weird term. The f aldehydes, the ratios of the fats. Holy sh**. What I eat are nuts and seeds, and that means things like walnuts. Well, you shouldn't be eating those either, but this video isn't focused on plants. We're just focused on the seed oils part, so I'll be sparing here and I won't talk about it, but binge my channel for more information. Things like cashews, these are pecans. I eat a lot of sunflower. I eat sesame seeds, flax seeds, chia seeds, and that's the bulk of what I eat. There are some occasional hazel- Well, that's a problem. That is a major, major problem. If that is the majority of what you eat, you are bereft of essential nutrients and also are just inundating yourself with toxic nonsense, like fiber, for example. Again, binge my channel for more information on that. Or buy my book, Contraindicated, once again. Link in the description below. Academia nuts, but for the most part, that's what I eat. I eat a very unusual diet. I don't talk about it that much because it doesn't work for many people. But <laughs> wow day 40 50 sometimes even 60 percent of my daily calories come from the no you don't get calories from food sorry that's not how it works you don't eat calories you get zero calories every single day in terms of what you eat in terms of how many you eat just ridiculous nope nonsense oils so when i started hearing all this hype about polyunsaturated fatty acids even though i was eating whole foods i no, you're not eating whole foods that isn't food we cover this remember Maybe there's a connection. I better, number one, go get my book. Those are not the same things. Lucas, the fact that you believe that those are the same things shows how absolutely inept you are at being sagacious enough within the nutrition space to even be able to give information, let alone to be able to actually discern what is indicated for you particularly to eat. You should not be making videos. 
said, number two, I better look into the published literature to see if, well, I'm killing myself. Well, you don't know how to interpret that. You don't even know the rudimentary levels of that, I would suspect. That is not science. That's human theology. That is human nutrition theology. The reason why is because you cannot control for human beings. You can't actually perform experiments on human beings. Therefore, if there's not complete control over human beings, it is by definition theory generating. I went to the doctor. My N equals one anecdotal evidence is I'm doing great. My A1C. Fantastic. A1C is low. Great. Fantastic. Great. Doesn't have any sugar in that, by the way. So your A1C probably won't be that affected. My fasting insulin is low. My triglycerides, my LDLC is low. Well, that's not a good thing, most likely. The LDL cholesterol, which isn't actually cholesterol. So this is just a fallacious term here. LDL cholesterol. No, there's LDL and then there's cholesterol. And also that isn't measured. You don't know if it's low or not. How do you know that? It's based on a regression sum with an error around it. You don't know what your LDL level is. Neither do the doctors that claim that they measured it. Seeing blood glucose is around 93. Everything's going just great. For um, okay. But that doesn't matter. We need to look at a broader picture. I assumed when I dug into the research that I'd find at least some inclination, some little nugget of truth. But not only with my blood results, when I looked into the published literature, not only could I find a grain of truth, it actually goes the other way. In fact, so much benefits as a cause and effect statement. That little word that was flashed up on the screen was a cause and effect relationship, or at least it drew one. There are no studies to inform upon the benefits of any food or any activity with respect to any aspect of human nutrition over any given period of time throughout the entire time human nutrition science has existed. You would know that if you knew how to even interpret it just a slight bit, just the rudimentary levels of that science, you would know that. I actually thought, maybe I should start reconsidering eating canola oil, don't worry. What the hell is wrong with you then? Oh, there, I still don't eat canola oil, no, nor do I think you should. But it is a little more nuanced that, than that, which we'll explain here in just a moment. In any case, you look at all the different published studies, you will find zero correlation between seed oils and inflammation. Here's just one. It doesn't matter. We already covered the biochemistry behind things, didn't we? We covered the chemistry, which is a hard science. You have theology in your hands. And also, by the way, if I looked hard enough, really, it probably wouldn't be that hard at all, we probably would be able to find some associations. I would suspect, actually. Perspective study from 2010. Don't care what this says, for the same reasons that I already laid out. 16, these researchers looked at 37 different papers. Okay, so it's a meta-analysis, it's a review. What were these 37 articles from? Were they 37 different studies? And what did the studies look like? What demographic were they? What was the sample size? What was the conflict of interest? Who are the authors? How long did the study go on for? What was the age range? Once again, the demographic. Was it based on respondent data? You can't observe what people eat, so it was based on respondent data. People lie, people forget. Just nonsense. We're trying to find a correlation between dietary fat and inflammatory markers. And again, they found no association. And in right, so how long did the studies go on for? Did they only eat them for a week? It's even found that these PUFA oils reduced inflammation. No, reduced is a cause and effect term. That was an association. There's no evidence that they did so at all. What else were these people eating? And what else were these people omitting whenever they actually substituted for canola oil? And how much canola oil were they using? That's another factor here. Looking at like lipid levels, like blood cholesterol, if you're doing swaps like saturated fat, even for something like canola oil, the net result is often very, very positive. So not No, not positive, because positive is a value judgment statement and also implies a cause and effect relationship. We're done here. So not only is there not a grain of truth. No, there's a swath of truth that you're evading. Truth behind these seed oils actually puts them in a much more positive light than not positive. That's an opinion and that's predicated upon theology. We already covered that, didn't we? General world in general holds these things to be true. Canola oil is a fake boogeyman, and by fake boogeyman... No, it's not a fake boogeyman. What's fake is this information that you're promulgating here. What I mean is, in the past 20 years, I have literally spoken and produced events where we presented... As opposed to figuratively spoken? ...tens of thousands of people with dozens of different experts, people much more qualified... Than experts is a vapid term. It means nothing nowadays. Done. ...medical doctors, dietitians, nutritional coaches, everyone in between, and never once, not a single time, in over two decades, have I ever heard anyone recommend you drizzle canola oil on your steamed vegetables? It's not a thing. The reason people you know what you see is people discouraging saturated fat content and telling them to replace it with seed oils. So what do you think the effects of that are? What do you think that redounds to? The reason people use canola oil is because it's inexpensive, costs about 20% of what a high quality oil would be. You ever think that that's actually the reason why it's promoted so much too, and put in everything? And in order to spin it to make it more justifiable that they do so, they manipulate people into thinking that it's healthy, more healthy than saturated fat? You ever think that's the case? Completely neutral, so it doesn't really taste like anything. This means in That's why people use it? Wouldn't you want- <sighs> of restaurants and cheap restaurants, this means in all the packaged processed foods, they use these things because they're cheap and they're ubiquitous. They are, however, not stable, and that's why I don't eat them. And that's why I don't think you should eat them either. 
Let's forget about- What the hell- what, what the hell was the previous four minutes then? So yeah, they are unstable. They are prone to oxidation. They oxidize whenever you create them. They oxidize further when you cook with them. And they oxidize further when you consume them. That's not good. That's a propitious approach to causing inflammation. But then you just said that that doesn't matter because there's no association between them and inflammation. So if it doesn't matter, then why does it matter if they're unstable? Lucas. Hey, tribes, let's forget about the conspiracy thinking and the fake boogeyman. It's not a fake boogeyman. What, what is your position here? Down what you need to know about fats. There are three main categories of fats and they do over- Oh, let him tell us about what categories of fats there are and what they do. Meaning most fats have a mix of saturated, mono and polyunsaturated, but for simplicity's sake, we'll throw them into a bucket. The saturated fats are solid at room temperature. So butter, ghee, tallow. That implies that the unsaturated are not, which is not always the case because in the case of margarine, it is also solid. Monounsaturated fats are liquid at room temperature but they turn solid in the refrigerator, like olive oil. And the polyunsaturated fats, those are the corn, canola, soy, sunflower, safflower, all the yellow cheap oils in the grocery store, they're always liquid. The more saturated, the more stable, the less saturated, the less stable. But that what does it mean by less stable? More prone to oxidation? Oxidation being the loss of electrons and something that leads to tissue damage and inflammation and also cellular derangement, so also inflammation. Something that you said seed oils are not associated with and therefore is a fake boogeyman. What is your position here? The one that we always cook with are the ones we should never cook with, not because they're demons by design, but simply because structurally- Oh, no, they're not demons, but they're contraindicated and insalubrious, and we know this, biochemically speaking. They're not really up to the task. They're highly prone to oxidative damage, light damage, and heat damage, which means if you're going to cook, you should cook with a stable oil. The ones that have been used traditionally- No, not oil. You should not let one drop of oil pass your lips. False, Lucas. Fat, you should be eating, always world in the form of animal fat primarily from ruminant animal meat the butter or coconut oil palm oil ghee that might well, get rid of the palm oil and get rid of the coconut oil coconut oil is okay it's actually more saturated than most animal fat but for the sake of this stick with the animal fat it's what we evolved on Aloe or goose fat these more stable oils are going to be a better choice they're not oils fats and oils are not the same thing sorry Unsaturated fats are okay. Things like olive oil, they're a lot- Well, plant monounsaturated oils tend to be different than animal monounsaturated oils in terms of the ratios. So you shouldn't be eating that either. In many cases, you can see that monounsaturated oils will downregulate one inflammatory pathway, sure, but then upregulate another one markedly. So they're still inflammatory, just not as much as polyunsaturated fatty acids. Susceptible to heat damage and light damage, but you should never cook with these. Again, not because they're evil, but because they're not designed for heat. And this is really the fundamental problem with seed oils. It's this umbrella term to talk about things as if they're all the same. They're really not- Because seed oils are not the same as the oils that are naturally found in walnuts if you squeeze one. We're not saying that. Let's just look at a couple of examples. But no, you shouldn't be eating them at all because they're already oxidized after the heat and pressure that's imposed onto them or employed within the process of creating those oils in the first place. They're prone to further oxidation, yes, but they're already oxidized. Here's a cashew, here's a walnut. Yes, they both have a lot of fiber and a lot of fat and a little bit of protein, but this walnut- Usually harmful protein, like lectins. Lectins are plant proteins. You don't incorporate those into bodily tissues. The omega-3 fats, essential fatty acids, omega-3, that's really interesting. This cashew, in order to be processed, has to undergo a little bit of heat. You might not have known that. It also contains something called aflatoxin, which is the same toxin, mold toxin, that's present in peanuts. Well, there you go. There's another reason why you shouldn't be f***ing eating it. A little bit suspicious and might cause you problems. There are things like flax seeds, really high in omega-3s, chia seeds. They're high in alpha-linolenic acid. It's not bioavailable. It has to go through a conversion process, which is arduous for the body to actually perform high in omega-3 and pretty high in protein as well. You can't throw all these things into the same category. We never did, you did. That was a straw man argument. Really very different. And the truth is it's possible to get cold pressed, dark bottle stored, refrigerated sesame oil. Fantastic. I would argue that that is better than getting a regular rancid seed oil like canola oil that's found commercially in stores. It doesn't mean that you should still be eating it because it's still not indicated. The fatty acid profile is not congruous with what we are designed to eat, sorry nut seed oil that's just fantastic to drizzle on a salad but that's very different than a highly refined high temperature processed deodorized oil like a canola oil so it's not that rapeseed is evil but the way it's presented we never said evil you're using straw man arguments in order to disparage ours our real argument I encourage you to avoid it the same way you might avoid croutons and instead opt for like a natural 
bread that's made. No, neither, because they're laden with toxins and also carbohydrates, which are toxins. Insoluble fiber as well, which in my opinion is the worst kind to eat. Flour and salt and yeast and water, for example. How does all of this affect you? With nutrition and nutritional ideas that get passed around, everything becomes very tribal. A few years ago, I was really excited because it seemed like the conversations were all coming. Don't act like you're not tribal, just like everyone else is. The majority of them, at least. Unfortunately, we're at a moment where things are really gone wacky and extremes. Where yeah, and that's evinced and demonstrated within this video right here. That can be seen in this video right here, Lucas. Where people are starving themselves, they're trying to live off. Well, the starving themselves thing has to do with the calories thing, and you just used the word calories, so. For elimination diets with tomahawk steaks and salt and water and nothing. Hyper elimination diet, it's the species appropriate, species specific diet for human beings. Not the tomahawk steaks part, ruminant animal meat, the muscle meat, not organs. People are focused on nutrientism rather than holistic health. And what you need to understand is there's a lot of different paths to the same end. There are a lot of different ways to be healthy and a lot of different ways to be unhealthy. But if you were going to shoot from the hip, if you were going to choose the clearest path towards health, whether you're- You would adopt the species appropriate, species specific diet for human beings, that being the flesh and associated fat of large ruminant animals primarily, with added fat in the forms of animal fat, the stuffed solid room temperature, butter, tallow, large suet and ghee, added salt to taste and water, as established by stable nitrogen and carbon isotope analyses conducted in 2019 and further in 2021, that established unequivocally and unambiguously that 80% of our fuel intake came from the flesh and associated fat of large ruminant animals, with the other 20% coming from large fibrous tubers that, inferentially speaking, were only consumed during times of starvation and or unsuccessful hunts or food scarcity. And the other bit of that 20% being constituted of fruit that we consumed during the ever ephemeral, ever transient fruit season. With that fruit being nothing like the fruit we see today, which is extremely large, extremely juicy, extremely sweet, and extremely starchy in the case of things like plantains and bananas due to human hybridization and grafting. That's what you would do. From the boring, probably misguided food pyramid. Or probably misguided. Really? It's fraudulent. It was predicated upon false data and manipulated data. We know this for a fact. You're eating a very, very bizarre diet like me based on nuts and seeds and plants. The most yeah, well, that's a problem. That is an extreme problem, Lucas. And you will see the effects of that problem later on if you haven't already. The thing is that you focus on whole food nutrition. Well, that isn't food right there. We already covered that. This is a meretricious term in order to aggrandize and adorn things like nuts and seeds. Less processing, less problems. Less well, everything's processed. But yes, I know what you mean. Less ultra processing, sure. Find more likely- But that's not necessarily going to be indicative of quality and indication. He can respond appropriately. When you study healthy people around the world, you find that their fat sources, their food sources are really- Association, also. You're sort of obliquely referencing and tacitly referencing blue zones, which actually eat immense amounts of meat. That data was skewed. But what you will find consistently is they're eating more from the produce aisle and less from the convenience store. They're eating- Fantastic. Healthy user bias. There are a myriad of confounders within this association or within these associations. Blue Zone Myth is exactly that. It's a myth. I wrote about it in my book Contraindicated in Chapter 3. Please go ahead and buy that book if you haven't already. It's linked in the description below. The ebook, the hardcover, the paperback, whatever your choice may be. A lot more natural foods and a whole lot less refined. You said natural foods and then just pointed and gestured towards the seed oils. That's always a simple way to go. This oil thing can be really confusing and there's a lot of marketing and packaging and expensive products based around it to help you decipher it all i put a little pdf down below just to give you some ideas when you go to the grocery store don't look at that don't look at it the ideas are going to be misled and misguided completely diet agnostic whether you're ketogenic or carnivore whether you're vegan or vegetarian there's a list of different oils that okay so this is also a very common tactic you cater to every crowd in order to be anodyne and to not provoke dissent or offense in any way in order to garner a following and to seem more forgiving and laid back i guess a good thing to have in the kitchen and whether you should heat with it really is just a way to beguile people into his actual ideology because every single person on the face of this planet has an ideology not down in the description below. If you find this video helpful, I'd love it if you hit subscribe down below. Well, I'm not gonna hit subscribe. This video was not helpful. It was misinformative and it was misguided. Notified every week when I publish a new video, we focus on health span, living your best life in the second half and to that. But you don't know what that is. You don't know what the methods are in order to actually effectuate that.
I have a program called Yoga Body Daily. You might find interesting. We do stretch and strength and steps every day. And you can find all those details at yogabody.com. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you in the next video. No, you won't. Anyway, go ahead and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Buy my book as well if you haven't already. And also subscribe to the Patreon if you enjoyed the video. Also hit the like button. Leave your thoughts in the comment section below. Also, if you are actually wanting to ameliorate inflammation from things like seed oils in your past, and you've already adopted a carnivorous diet bereft of carbohydrates and plant material really to speak of, and you still think you need an extra punch or an extra kick, which is a thing, I would suggest referring to the link on the screen below, the Cerule link. And also, before you do that, if you haven't already, go ahead and refer to the link in the top right corner of the screen, which is a video that I entitled Cerule Products. It's the updated version, which gives you all of the details that you may need as to what the products are, who should be taking them, et cetera, et cetera. So do that. And also email me at edgoki14 at gmail.com if you have any questions, or if you would like to ask me as to how you can get those products for free, by the way. And with that being said, join me next time when we react to someone else that does not know what they are talking about at all with respect to, in this case, health and nutrition, which is typically the case. But till then.